Good morning and welcome to track two sessions. We have our next speaker, Mr. Rohit Chaudhary with us. He's a PMP certified and having 25 years of diverse experience in different industries. He's an ex-army veteran. That interests me. I would like to hear something uh, regarding that experience. And I'm sure everybody in the crowd would like to. He leads the Center of Excellence in IT domain and is with Reliance Industries. The topic for today is accept the VUCA world and then act. I'm sure many of us have heard VUCA, what it is. So let's hear it from Mr. Rohit Chaudhary, please. Thank you, Saili. Uh, you will hear a lot about my army experience. Uh, so, uh, okay. Okay, the topic that I'm going to talk about is accept the VUCA world and then act. Now, I'm sure most of you know what VUCA means. There is nothing new, nothing that you haven't heard. But while this discussion on disruption and uh, you know, everything that happens and what it does to project management uh, happens, I think it is very important to, to put it under a, you know, a frame of reference. And uh, VUCA is just a terminology that provides us that, that frame of reference. You know, what it essentially means is that the environment around us is volatile. We know that sometimes that the, the speed at which things happen, the speed at which change comes along, takes us by surprise, which is what volatility means. We know that things are complex. There are many, many projects that we do where stakeholders pop up at, at the you know, penultimate uh, moment and we have never thought that they existed in the past. So that is what complexity probably means. Uncertainty is the lack of predictability of our actions. There is no, you know, no clear cut. We do not know how things are going to pan out as we go along. And ambiguity is the problem of multiple versions of reality, which, which all of us, I think, in the, at least in the corporate world, definitely we face it all the time. There are no past use cases to rely on for many of the things that we do. Uh, for, for instance, uh, projects like uh, uh, demonetization and, and you know uh, we will not get into that because that's a debatable subject but the fact is that there are no past case studies for for anyone to be able to in black and white judge whether the exercise is a success or a failure so that's the only point I'm trying to make now uh, wh why is it important to discuss it now we are all project uh, guys you know so uh, we like to roll up our sleeves and we like to execute and that is by nature I think in this profession we get wired to address uh, day-to-day -day issues uh, and we only feel most satisfied when we are executing something. Now uh, sometimes it is I think important to step back from, from that and look at what is happening in the ecosystem around us. You know? uh, 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 I'll give you an example in one of the companies uh, I was uh, delivering an outsourcing contract and uh, in what happens is that the service provider makes an investment in the beginning. You know, uh, uh, you invest in infrastructure, hardware, software, all of that. And uh, then you recover, the, the revenue comes in the form of an OPEX uh, charge to the customer. Now, in those first three months, when that outsourcing contract got executed, the company had gone bankrupt, right? So it, it was, and I was a projects guy, I never realized, I, I don't understand balance sheets and I never looked at what is happening to the stocks of the company. But having invested three months of effort and the company's money into it, it was only to realize that one of the metro projects in, in South India had gone wrong and they were never going to be in a position to pay us for that contract, which was my problem, right? So it is, I think, important to raise our head, come out of our project tasks and look at the environment that's happening around us. And therefore, it is important to, uh, to spend some time thinking about, uh, uh, about uh, you know, the uh, VUCA world around us. Now, some, there is also a perspective that, one perspective is that, you know, as project guys, we take refuge in the fact that uh, nothing is in our control, you know, there is so much volatility everywhere, why should I plan, there is no point doing it, and uh, umpteen number of time, my profession requires me to talk to project managers, and we see that uh, people give up in despair, that there is no point doing all this, because, because it's so many things out of my control, what can I do? Right? So it is, it is, there is the, the pitfall is that sometimes as project management professionals, and, and this is something that we can introspect, it is not me lecturing here, but uh, that do we think that the volatility around us, we take it as an excuse 
to not execute on on you know on the plans that we could or we are expected to as project management professionals right so it, it is just a thought to leave you uh, so that you are aware of it and why am i talking about it is because yes like like someone has said that not learning from a failure is a bigger failure you know it's not the failure that is the catastrophe itself but not learning from it now uh, why am i talking about it uh, i was briefly introduced maybe i'll just take two sentences more i spent about 15 years in the army and in all of those 15 years my wife kept telling me that i have been at the wrong place at the wrong time okay so when i got uh, passed out of the academy in 1990 i uh, as a young officer i wanted to go to jammu and kashmir and fight the insurgents now as government departments function they put me in assam well, there were insurgents there so i fought some people there but i wanted to go to jammu and kashmir uh, some time down the line i still wanted to go to jammu and kashmir but they put me in punjab and punjab also had a fledging terrorist issue at that time and i i remember those days those were tough days i spent 3 years in punjab uh, in the face of uh, you know fighting uh, terrorists of course i come from an engineering arm myself in the army but providing technical support to the troops that fought is uh, is as much as fighting itself you know in in many ways and finally after having put in 8 years in the army my wish came true and i was posted to Jammu and Kashmir in the Ladakh region. Okay, Ladakh is the topmost point where uh, we we claim uh, uh, where India is. And lo and behold, next year the Kargil war happened. Okay, so I I, I think there was some logic in my wife's uh, inference that I have been at the wrong place at the wrong time, but not that it was wrong to be at the war, uh, you know, in the war zone. I think it was a great experience, and I'm going to talk about that as we go along. I'm sorry, I'm rushing a little bit because I have been given a deadline, so uh, it's okay. Uh, just try and catch up with me, and if you want to stop me, you can uh, please feel free to sort of. Uh, uh. Okay, so this is the spring of 1999. Beautiful place, unspoilt, you know, as beautiful as nature can be. I'm sure most of some, most of you, many of you may have uh, travelled to this part of the world. This is the Indus River that flows, and I was posted uh, just ahead of uh, Leh, which is the capital of Ladakh, and I was responsible to maintain or provide technical support to a brigade of artillery guns. Now, artillery is uh, uh, is the term that uh, we use for guns that fire long range they fire 18 to 20 kilometers mostly into the enemy territory obviously the enemy also has such guns so they also fire it's not a one sided thing <laughs> and uh, <laughs> a brigade uh, meant about 136 into 3 three, three regiments so that is about 108 uh, field guns that had to be maintained in an operationally fit state all the time right they had to be kept firing irrespective of what happened so the people who did the handled the equipment were different but my job was to provide technical support and the way army is organized a technical support unit generally has all trades you know so gun was one specialty to maintain guns but i will also be responsible to maintain their vehicles radio sets communication equipment all of that so a detachment of about 120 people was what i was commanding as a major and i had uh my area of responsibility included this beautiful uh, town called kargil which is about 170 or about 200 kilometers from leh so this was my span as well you know so if there was something to happen the guns would act be active in this uh, sector but it was a blissful time you know i was newly married and it was like uh, you know, the most beautiful part of the world to be in and i had come down to uh, this was in may of 1999 i was in badoda for a few weeks to do some you know some uh, official work and in the last week of may i think it was the 25th of may or something we had we had seen sporadic reports in newspapers that something was not right on the border you know something was beginning to happen but nothing was very clear so i i was told one evening i had come back after a, a cup of tea in the M, on the ms university road in badoda having a good time with my friends and i was told that i need to board a flight late in the night you know there was a flight to chandigarh that uh, an air force flight going and i and i need to pack up and move right now flying to chandigarh is not good news because chandigarh is the logistics base for all of that ladakh region okay so anyone who's asked to fly to chandigarh means you are going on to the onward flight into ladakh and as luck would have it i boarded that um, i dumped all my stuff and some friends to take care of that uh, took whatever i had boarded the flight i was at chandigarh early in the morning and i was told that i have been manifested on the next flight to leh because something is wrong and people are being recalled okay so possibly the 26th of may or something i was I landed at the uh, leh airport Uh, early in the morning all flights operate very early because then the turbulence becomes too much and uh, as i landed the normal practice in 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 army or most of these places 
uh, is that you acclimatize for a few days, you know, because the altitude is so high, your lungs are not used to it, and you're expected to acclimatize for at least four to five days as a standard operating procedure in the army till you take on some strenuous task. But this time when I landed, I knew something was not right. You know, I had landed there at least 10 times in the past, and each time there was a need to acclimatize where you were put in a, you know, by isolation and you're supposed to rest. But this time I knew when I met my boss um, uh, right there in Leh, he says that you need to rush, uh, your men are waiting. Uh, please uh, move to Kargil immediately. And there was no, there was such a frenzy in the atmosphere that there was no question of talking about what acclimatization, what will happen to my lungs. Nobody, you know, that was a, that would have been a too trivial a question, even if it was putting my life at risk. And frankly, it did not even cross my mind. It was only when I thought about it later that I realized that all these uh, procedures had gone out of the window for the moment. Okay. So uh, that, that that very day, by about 12 o'clock, I had reached uh, my unit. You know, the 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 subordinates had been tasked already what to do. There were eight to ten trucks of uh, spares, equipments, and you know some specialist lorries, etc. That we had, and about a hundred men who were ready, packed up to move to Kargil. Okay. And uh, while Google Maps may claim that it is six and a half hours, of course, this is now 20 years later. This all this happened in 1999. It takes a long while actually to travel because I'll show you some of the snaps. Uh, there were no mobile cameras to take snaps, so I've had to download it all from the net to recreate it for you. But uh, you know, it took us about uh, about 12 hours to get from the place that I was to to Kargil. And uh, uh, the sum of what it looked like was uh, sorry. Yeah, so th this is the kind of roads, you know, you have waterways, you have culverts, or, I mean, all sorts of things, and there are convoys, there are hundreds of vehicles going in, and, and nothing was very clear. So uh, I just went there, I found my men were ready, more or less, or whatever they thought they are going to require in the battlefield, they had taken it, uh, and I moved with them, and by the time I reached Cargill, it was about, about midnight, right? And I could see that the, I had been there a number of times, it no longer looked as beautiful as it otherwise did. There was a lot, there were a lot of uh, dumps on fire. There were, uh, you know, where we store our petrol uh, and uh, fuel and etc. And there was heavy shelling going on. The TV tower had been shelled there. There was a FCI godown which had been raised to dust absolutely by Pakistani shelling, which was incidentally very, very accurate, right? So yeah, I was sort of dazed, you know. I, I went there, I met a, a colleague of mine who was based in Kargil, and I asked him what's going on. So, okay, things are not too good. You need to, you know, we just need to get our act together. That's all I was told. And I went and met my commander who was located in Kargil and who was responsible for the artillery operations there, right? He was, uh, he was the one I was to report to in the battlefield. I went and met him about one o'clock in the night in that underground bunker. And of course, he was also sleepless and dazed. And all I saw was a map on the wall, which had some red spots like this, you know. And not that I could make sense out of what was happening, but I just knew that there were, you know, 100 odd red spots on that map. And I could get a sense that some uh, something was wrong. There was an infiltration, or there were multiple infiltrations of Pakistani troops that had happened across the Indian line of control, and the uh, the we were trying to get a get our act together. You know, that's all that I understood in those five or ten minutes that I spent in the ops room. And my commander says, uh, Rohit, uh, okay, welcome back. Uh, we need to make sure that the guns keep firing, otherwise the boys are going to lose their life. Okay, otherwise our men are going to lose their life. This is all that he told me. Uh, and go your, and deploy yourself, you know, go and start helping the uh, people who are in the field. So now this was one or two o'clock in the night. I took the, uh, again, my uh, men were tired. They had been on the road, so we could some snatch some rest and we went and deployed ourselves somewhere. Now I had no clue where exactly on the map I was at that time, okay? I, uh, I uh, in proximity, we had one or two, uh, you know, some troops were deployed. So we dug for the night. I mean, when you, uh, in these places, when you uh, rest for the night, it is not that you rest. You actually dig trenches first, right, to defend yourself locally. And then half the people rest. And then the other half will, you know, do the duty and the uh, remaining will rest. So uh, we dug for the night. It was about four or five in the morning. and. Uh, I was now beginning to lose my sense of timing and day, you know, what was happening. I mean, so much had happened in the last 24 or 36 hours for me that I, I just didn't know. I was just going with the flow of what, hap what would have happened. Uh, suddenly there was a mortar firing, you know, mortar is a short range weapon. It is not like that 18, 20 kilometers. And when you receive mortar fire, it means the enemy is somewhere close, you know, that's less than one kilometer range actually. Now. Uh, so even while we were supposed to be resting, there was no question of resting. And at least as the person responsible for my troops, there was no question that I could get any rest. 
but we could not solve that mystery of where the mortar fire came from. All my, the point that I am trying to make is that I was somewhere near the L, uh, line of control, but I didn't know how far the enemy was. You know, and it was late in the night, and we had absolutely no clue and nobody to guide us at that time. And uh, when 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 things happen, they they take you by surprise. So, why am I recounting this experience? Let us come back to. Mm, sorry. Okay, let's come back to my. You know, subject of volatility. So uh, it is my personal experience that sometimes the speed of change will take you by surprise. That is the reality of this world. It is just that I found myself in an organization where this was a way of life, you know. And in fact, it was not even a way of life, despite the fact that we had trained for it for many, many years, you know. We trained for a war for all our lives, but when it happens, it just takes you totally by surprise, right? And there are challenges, and we, you don't know how long things are going to last. There are, there are every problem seems to require an immediate, uh, you know, attention. You don't know, and uh, there is very little information available about what the reality is. You know, there are data points you can you can pick up here and there, but but the fact is that the, the very little of that is actually useful. So as a leader, it is very natural to feel unprepared to lead, right? It is uh, uh, the, the only thing that I remember is that I understood my commander's intent that keep the guns firing and that, that's all. There was nothing more that he had to tell me. And it was my job to break it down into you know, physical goals of how to achieve that. And uh, uh, I think uh, uh, maybe this is a management prophecy that if, if there's nothing else you can do, try and build in some inventory because you don't know what you will need. So if possible, build a bench for, you know, for use in the future. So that is as far as volatility uh, goes. I am um, sure there are multiple examples in our corporate experiences, right? I am just trying to uh, pick out the unique ones that, uh, that I can talk about. So come day two, and now uh, I drive along the road. I showed you the map of uh, Cargill and, uh, okay, so somewhere, you know, along this Cargill Batalic sector, there, there is something that goes, there is a road that goes along the line of control and it comes, uh, you know, uh, back this way. So I found myself driving on that road because that is where the guns that I was required to support were. We were under direct, direct observation of the Pakistani army at, at many points. So they were taking pot shots at the road, but you had to drive through. Again, there was no question of not driving through because somebody needed help at the other end. So all I could do is tell my drivers that, you know, Joe, uh, God will take care of us, let's just go through. And uh, 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 fortunately for us, there were no casualties and I could drive and we reached uh, a point in Batalik where I could uh, deploy my, uh, you know, workshop and some sort of a, some sort of a sanity began to, uh, began to appear in the whole thing, right? The only problem was that I had been responsible to maintain uh, about, like I said, three regiments or a brigade of field guns, you know, field guns, which is Indian field guns, and they are of a slightly different nature than the one that is shown here. But what I discovered within the next 24 hours was that the battlefield suddenly had a new darling, you know, that nobody was talking about those hundred odd field guns. There were Bofors guns which had been brought in from some other sector, and it was found that these guns were more effective than the ones that we were trying to you know, uh, use and maintain all this while, or we had thought that will work in this sector. The added advantage was that these guns could fire almost 30 kilometers into the enemy territory as against the Indian field guns, and, and these are very advanced, you know, technologically very advanced. Now, the boys, the men that I had, the spares that we had, the tools and literature that we had was all of a different set of equipment. But nobody was talking about that, and suddenly everybody was talking about Bofors, right? I'm sure many of you saw this on the, on the, on the TVs as well, right? These guns made, made news. While you may have seen this perspective, the perspective that I was required to look at was something like this, and this was not available. The technicians needed drawings to be able, able to, I mean, and these equipment require a lot of maintenance, you know. When you fire them incessantly, there are windows, short windows that you get to execute some preventive maintenance tasks, and sometimes some parts fail, so even those have to be repaired on site. But there were no drawings available, right? As, a, as the uh, manager for, for managing my uh, troops there, we were totally handicapped. I had no way to shout back to my commander and say that, sir, this is madness going on, we cannot work like this, you know. All these equipment, and we, we cannot service it. What would happen is that my shout would be lost in the din, you know. You realize that? The communication channels itself are choked, 
at the war time and they are more uh, you have to give priority to the operational uh, you know instructions rather than a tech support or a technical support uh, uh, officer trying to reach out to call out for an emergency it doesn't work and that was the reality and even if i could get my voice across the answer as i had expected would be that you are the engineering support guy please sort it out right i cannot do anything i mean he is like a business guy in the corporate sense you know he is worried about his business he is not worried about my drawings not being available so challenge number 1 challenge number 2 am i pointing this right or there sorry okay challenge number 2 now unlike what you may have seen in movies a war is a massive logistics effort you know more than anything else there are thousands and thousands of troops there is ammunition there is food there is supplies that have to be brought into the sector right so uh, uh, there would be a lineup of uh, both civilian and army trucks day in and day out and as the tech again the technical entity there one of the responsibilities for us we were given areas of the road to maintain clear if, because if that is not clear the the trucks will pile up on either side okay and all of these that go into the war zone also have to go back so there is a hell of a lot of you know traffic management that goes on unfortunately if uh, if if convoys come this is also what happens right now what do you do in a situation like this imagine if there are 600 vehicles behind this i cannot get a towing van to you know start clearing the road or uh, there is no way you can even reach there so what do you think can be done yes absolutely okay so you can say that we will handle the auditors when they come we will handle the documentation when the time comes but an innovative idea is to sort of uh, uh, you know do away with it <laughs> okay so uh, uh, coming back to uh, what i am supposed to be talking uh, nobody except those on the ground some signs of uncertainty nobody except those on ground realize the crisis we face it again many times in in other in the it projects that i later handled in my life we have seen this uh, there is a direction par paralysis from the top very little can be expected and we seem to lose our objectivity about you know what are the new threats risks challenges no, no, nobody really has the time or the we tend we tend to lose our senses even in an organization sometimes so all that if i were to introspect and uh, say what could have been done is that at the lateral level one could possibly try and seek as much information and details as possible don't always look at the top to get directions but even look laterally and that helped me i will i'll just come to that in a while uh, get in some fresh perspectives uh, the plans okay uh, it is said in the army that the no plan ever survives the first contact with the enemy so we spend all our lives making plans but first bullet that the enemy fires the plan is the first thing that go, goes out of the window but in any case it is important to plan with but uh, with a willingness to accept some flex flexibility within that and if possible try and uh, try and you know through the through the haze of everything uh, try and look ahead about what is going to going to uh, come because the reality is that there is uncertainty even in the minds of people who are sitting on top it is it's not just you so uh okay next problem so this is as far as uh, you know i'm just trying to compartmentalize them but all of you know uh, uh, volatility uncertainty and complexity they they coexist actually in different degrees it is not that they exist in watertight compartments it's just for the sake of a discussion i'm uh, sort of uh, uh, taking it up one by one now now with the guns firing uh, 24 hours a day they are not designed to fire like that in a highly projectized environment okay the fire plans are made in detail down to the last minute i'll tell you why generally you use these long range weapons to precipitate you know your fire power on the enemy so that the head is kept down and you soften them up and then at some point at some vulnerable point of time the foot soldiers go and attack okay Th that's the normal uh, tactic so one is that they had if it ha if a gun had to fire at 2 o'clock in the night it had to fire there was no point firing at 25 pm you know am it didn't make sense because by 2 5 am your boys would have moved up that hill so it has to be absolutely precise and for that reason in a 24 by 7 window we would get, of course get the fire plan slightly early but uh, with great precision you need to make make sure that the guns kept firing okay now this equipment had been in use the bofors gun had been used for about the last 12 years in in the sachin glacier and those were the ones which which had been lifted to the war zone 
there was a phenomenal amount of wear and tear that those systems had undergone. They have a life there which is defined in the, you know, how much you can fire and how the barrel wears, the breech, a lot of parts that, you know, need to be maintained, uh, need to be changed or overhauled or serviced uh, depending on uh, uh, the usage. Now, what happened was with this concentrated usage, what we had thought will last another six months or maybe one year in the normal time, now that wear and tear happened in two weeks, you know. And this may have been now about mid of June. We had still not gained any success in the Cargill, uh, in you know, none of the posts really, or one odd we may have won, but it, there was general despair all around about uh, when is this going to end. The equipments began to fail, okay? I, I will quickly recount two of those instances. This is known as a breech block, and what you do is this thing snaps in, and you, you know, when you, when you sort of uh, 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 this handle, turn this handle, it, it is like a ceiling chamber, you know, for the, for the charge to take the, the ammunition or the payload ahead. So what happened was the ammunition that had come with the gun, with bow force, which we, our troops were used to, we ran out of that in, you know, during the war, and now from the headquarters, the trials of a new type of ammunition were ordered during the war. Okay, this is like, you know, <laughs> this is like <laughs> evaluating an engine while the aircraft is flying, you know. <laughs> so, uh, suddenly this was a, some uh, South African, or I don't know, some country uh, that was getting imported and we were told that now the ammunition needs to be evaluated. Uh, lo and behold, that ammunition was of a poor quality. And what would happen is that because of the high carbon content, these breech blocks would get jammed, okay? And if you, if it is jammed, it is a tough task to open it, right? So even during trials, we found them jammed. And now in opening it, if you forced open, something would break, right? And there was no way to get that something. That something existed in a 3600 parts of the Bofors weapon system. One had to look through, find the part number, and it would uh, in all probability be found in a depot in Jabalpur, which is where all the gun stocks were, okay? And, and there, was, there was poor, I mean, there was no way to sort of send somebody to get it from there. So, uh, by now, it was two weeks into the war, I had a gun armament trained officer. You know, I, I was myself not trained on guns, but I had somebody who understood guns better than me. And uh, he sort of deep dived into this problem. And what we realized is that when you open a breach, uh, you know, force, forcibly open it, what gives way is a, is a, is a very interesting component is a steel screw, okay? That's all that breaks. But in the standard operating procedures, the entire assembly, you know, seems is supposed to come back to the workshop and you're supposed to do 100 things with it to figure out what, you know, and then service it and send it back. Now, this gentleman was bright enough to suggest that if it is just a screw, let's take a chance, okay? Let's take a chance by replacing it on the site itself by fabricating that screw. Forget about going for finding the part number and the tensile strength of the screw. As long as there is no life threat to life, let's go ahead with it. And that is the only thing we evaluated that I hope it does not lead to an accident. And by manufacturing, you know, we, we, we had that capability to turn some metal and create some things. So uh, we could restore some of these breech blocks to keep the gun firing. Right? So, uh, uh, only point is that sometimes uh, that complexity is possible to break down by, by diving deep and especially by if it is experts who, who, who do that job. Okay, yes, next. Sorry, I'll... Uh, one of the things that also happened... Okay. This side? Okay. So one of the things that also happened was the, these guns come with a power unit, you know. Uh, uh, these Bofors guns have something known as an auxiliary power unit, which is an engine mounted on the this one. And like I showed you, the gradients of the roads are, you know, very steep. So there are very few places where actually, uh, you can actually tow it to a point, and then the gun has to power itself and go and deploy on a flat piece of ground, level itself properly, and only then it can be used for firing, right? So there is a local power unit that it had. Now the problem again was that these guns had been in use for 10, 12 years. And these are small engines, you know, like those that power a generator set. The only thing is the gun cannot work unless the engine is powered on. So what we realized that one after the other, the engines began to fail. Possibly because they were being run 24 hours, 24 by 7. They were in overuse. The dust and temperature conditions that they were exposed to were probably extreme. We don't know. So now what to do? Again, no such possibility of trying to do anything with the engine there. Once again, uh, one of the youngsters who, had, who was put with me was, the suggestion came from there that 
we fly the engines back to Chandigarh, and you know that you know people in, in that part of the country are very enterprising, right? They, they, they do a lot of this. The mechanical uh, work happens at a very great pace in Chandigarh, Patiala, and that belt. And if within a matter of three or four days, we could get about half a dozen engines overhauled in these local shops. Okay, this may not have been a permanent solution. There must have been some quality considerations. I don't know so much, but the fact was that what would have taken otherwise at least three months through the government you know, processes and machinery was possible, was made possible in a period of six to seven days. And this was also one of the contributors why we could keep one of you know, those Bofors guns that I had, about I think 30 or 36 of them in my span. Uh, so about six or seven of them could keep firing by some ingenious thinking like, like this. Okay, complexity. Uh, I think uh, this is prophecy, much of it uh, I have already said, integrated parts make uh, understanding difficult, predictions and all that fine. Uh, sometimes we do feel frustrated, we do feel you know, that I am the only one responsible for the organizational failure. I mean, that happens when you are isolated and particularly in a uh, theater zone like that, uh, that uh, one sort of, it, it can lead to some amount of frustration that I am not being able to do what I would otherwise, you know, otherwise should have been so easy. So uh, my, uh, my uh, take on this would be that allow the specialists, don't, don't be insecure about letting them experiment with whatever little uh, is possible. Uh, stop thinking about permanent solutions. Yes, I, I think that's a, that's a piece of advice. Of course, I, it's, it's not mine, but when I look at it in retrospective, I, I may have picked it up from some literature. But stop uh, seeking permanent solutions like that tensile strength of that screw or, or the quality of the engine overhaul. I, I don't think we could have tar tried to target 100% efficiency there. You know, there was no point. If we would have lost lives if we tried to do that. So maybe a calculated call on that can sometimes uh, in, in the heat of the moment be taken and uh, it can lead to better outcomes uh, for us. Okay, curb the competitive spirit. Yes, in particularly in the corporate world, I find that you know, in, in in organizations like the defense, you can associate with the larger cause of the organization. I mean, there's really no question about not defending your country, right? Whereas in the uh, comp in the corporate uh, world, I do find that sometimes our own competitive spirit, that I need to excel as a manager, as a team, as a department, uh, somewhere compromises with the organizational objective. And if it is, if one can. Uh, rise up, rise up to that organizational this one and give up your own uh, needs for uh, recognition or something that can also that can also help. Yes. Okay, so uh, uh, I'll uh, sure. So it's just my uh, I would say a suggestion if I were to make that. Uh, um, if we can get people, I mean, if you're in a leader's position and if you can get people to associate with a cause which is larger than what they see individually as a team or, you know, uh, is, will possibly help, you know. So uh, maybe I, I can take it up, we'll just come back to, I have a time signal there, so I'll just rush. <laughs> okay, ambiguity, the last of the things. Uh, uh, not so much in a, again, in a defense uh, organization because the hierarchy and structure is pretty much quite clearly defined there. So, but I am sure, I am sure all of you have experienced in your lives the, 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 you know, the ambiguous nature of projects that we jump into sometimes where there are, like I said, there are no existing uh, precedents for us to take cues from. There is a clash of perspectives that happen, especially, and I see that very often in Reliance, multidisciplinary projects where the engineering is, talks something which I don't understand as IT, and IT talks something which the uh, other people don't understand. Uh, and uh, the behaviors that I find can help us could possibly be to be a little more like, uh, I think uh, two of the speakers said this morning, that uh, be open more to listening than to talking, so that sort of, uh, uh, automatically it attracts the divergent views and enriches you know our ability to find a solution uh, encourage experimentation yes and celebrate small gains yes I think that's also important especially again in the corporate world that uh, uh, while we can get to the larger success of whatever we are trying to do the project will become successful one day but uh, just to get people on board keep them together and keep them identified with what is going on it may be a good idea to small uh, to celebrate small wins uh, as we go along you know so Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll wind up uh, in the next two to three minutes. Does this make life difficult for project managers? Yes, indeed it does, because we are hardwired. We are hardwired to predict the right outcomes of a project, you know, in, within the constraints. And whereas the, the need, the need that my commander may have been looking for, or the business looks for, 
is how to address the changing you know, nature of, 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 of things as they evolve. So there is obviously, a, 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 on one side, there is predictability that we are wired to sort of get at. On the other side, there is uncertainty that the business or the end user is seeking. So uh, if, I, if I gather, a, my job requires me sometimes to talk to project managers and, managers and do these surveys. If I ask them what are the biggest problems they have in life, all of them tell me that the requirements are not clear. The you know customer doesn't know what he's asking. Too many changes and sort of the scope just keeps creeping all the time, right? I, that's a common complaint. I, I, I <laughs> I'm sure you agree with me. So uh, uh, we complain and we feel like victims, right? I, I think I, I think that's normal. Now, so here is a spiritual guru whom I happen to read about, and uh, there are a couple of books I'm sure some of you may have read. Uh, uh, he says that if you're in conflict with a the situation, there are only three things you can do. Remove yourself from that situation, change it, or accept it fully. Okay? The first two in our uh, quest to earn our bread and butter, I don't think is possible. Right? <laughs> so the only option as far as my uh, advice would be is to accept it. And a small anecdote before I wind up, I was in an IT company and obviously being a projects guy, I was a delivery, you know, I was the delivery manager for a certain set of services in this part of the country. And I was absolutely 100% complaining all the time like I showed you on the previous slide, what the hell, what, what is this happening, you know, what do people sell and in service, you know how uh, many of these uh, services uh, things are. So in these companies there is something called delivery and there is something called sales, right? There are two different entities who are always at conflict at each other, with each other because we keep accusing them of I don't know what you have sold, that nothing is clear and they keep saying that you don't know how to deliver, you don't have the expertise, right? So one of my mentors came out with a brilliant idea, you know, maybe I was one of the vocal sort of, uh, I used to keep complaining all the time. So what he did was that he suggested to me that, look, I have an opening in sales, which the role of which is to introduce changes into the projects. Okay, go, you, you join the sales team as a, you know, uh, and advise the customer on how to introduce changes into ongoing projects because that means greater business for the company, right? And, and they called it a base growth. You know, I was called a project executive for base growth. So suddenly from a delivery guy, I was made a sales guy who was responsible to go and inject changes into this project, okay? I spent not very many, I spent about four or five quarters doing that job, but it was a liberating experience for me. And that is why possibly I took the, I had the courage to stand up here and talk about it. That was one of the good experiences of my life because, because I got an opportunity to look at changes from a close quarter to be forced to embrace it. Okay. And when I did that, uh, obviously, uh, Mr. Eckhart Tolle has uh, said that in, in his wisdom, but uh, I, in some, my own little way realized that uh, dropping that resent, you know, that resentment, that resistance you know, sort of uh, helped me, set me free. Okay. I hope listening to me today, I have the time signal there, so I hope listening to me today helps you in some way, helps you in your profession as individuals, as, as, as teams and organizations that you work for, and accepting the VUCA world also helps us all in the profession of project management. Thank you very much for patiently listening to me. take up the questions I have just one thing to say after the uh, seeing all the VUCA factors at war front yeah. don't you think sitting in the air conditioned office and the project management and the UI and cry that we are making about the VUCA is nothing uh, okay. <laughs> uh, uh, okay to the business you know uh, to the business maybe every single challenge or every big challenge is a war in itself so I, I don't want to undermine that by saying it but as a person, yes, I know that when, when your life is under threat, when the, you know, uh, when people under you do not know and you see your friends getting hit by shells, somebody you're having dinner with today is no longer there tomorrow. I have seen all of that. It sort of, uh, 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 it lifts you higher than, than uh, those mundane problems. And uh, if there is, if I were to get a, a beating in the boardroom, I will probably not worry. You know, <laughs> that's the, that's the uh, only. I mean, exactly. maybe it has because enriched me as a person. It's not a that's matter all. of life and death here Possibly. in the corporate Possibly. world, but definitely yes. it's a different thing in the war front. Uh, we'll just take up one question. Yeah. As you said, uh, related to the sales and delivery aspect, one yeah. of the contexts. 
uh, how VUCA suggest on a quality aspect uh, for such type of uh, environment? Okay. Now, uh, you know, my first take would be that th there are really no mantras, you know. After all, this is a management subject, so there, there cannot be a mantra. But uh, uh, it has been my experience, and uh, uh, I spent a few years working for one of the most renowned brands in, I mean, a big uh, IT company. I can tell you that the, they are successful companies, but at times they tend to overlook the quality aspect, okay, in, in their aggression to you have you are under pressure to launch products you are under pressure to create marquee customers you are under pressure you because otherwise the competition will beat you right so uh, maybe in instead of making a quest for perfection allowing things with known in imperfections i'm sorry my japanese friend is here he may not agree so much <laughs> but that is the american company's way of working and they are fairly successful companies so so that's my take you know that instead of vying for perfection Known imperfections are allowed to escape from the lab and go into the, uh, you know, uh, customer uh, uh, production systems. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, Thank you it so was much. an excellent presentation and an interesting topic. I would like you to please wait. Uh, I would like to request uh, Manish Dedia from PMI Mumbai chapter to felicitate uh, Mr. Rohit Chaudhary. Thank you.